And here we go, the very last two chapters of The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. I hope everybody really enjoyed this book. Um, it is one of my favorites. So let's get to it. Let's read the last two chapters here. And we are done with the novel study of The Boy in the Striped Pajamas. Chapter 19, What Happened the Next Day. The next day, Friday, was another wet day. When Bruno woke in the morning, he looked out of his window and was disappointed to see the rain pouring down. Had it not been for the fact that it would be the last chance for him and Schmel to spend any time together. Not to mention the fact that the adventure would be a very exciting one, especially since it involved dressing up. He would have given up on it for the day and waited until some afternoon the following week when he didn't have anything special planned. However, the clock was ticking and there was nothing he could do about it. After all, it was only the morning and a lot could happen between then and the late afternoon, which was when the two boys always met. The rain would surely have stopped by then. He watched out the window during morning classes with Hurlitz, but it showed no signs of slowing down then and even pounded noisily against the window. He watched during lunch from the kitchen when it was definitely starting to ease off and there was even the hint of sunshine coming from behind a black cloud. He watched during history and geography lessons in the afternoon when it reached its strongest force yet and threatened to knock the window in. Fortunately, it came to an end around the time that her list was leaving and so Bruno put on a pair of boots and his heavy raincoat and waited until the coast was clear and left the house. His boots squelched in the mud and he started to enjoy the walk more than ever he had ever before. With every step, he seemed to face the danger of toppling over and falling down, but he never did and managed to keep his balance. Even a particular bad part where when he lifted his left leg, his boots stayed implanted in the mud while his foot slipped right out of it. He looked up at the skies and although there was still very dark, he thought the day had probably had enough rain and he would be safe enough this afternoon. Of course, there would be difficulty of explaining why he was so filthy later on when he returned home, but he could put that down to being a typical boy, which was what mother claimed he was, and probably not get into too much trouble. Mother had been particularly happy over the previous few days as each box of their belongings had been sealed and packed into a truck for di dispatch to Berlin. Schmel was waiting for Bruno when he arrived and for the first time ever he was sitting cross-legged on the ground and staring at the dust beneath him but standing, leaning against the fence. Hello Bruno, he said when he saw his friend approaching. Hello Schmel, said Bruno. I wasn't sure if we'd ever get to see each other again with the rain and everything, I mean, and said Schmel. I thought you might be kept indoors. It was touch and go for a while, said Bruno. What with the weather being so bad? Schmel nodded and held out his hand to Bruno, who opened his mouth in delight. He was carrying a pair of striped pajama bottoms and striped pajama tops and a striped cloth cap exactly like the one he was wearing. It didn't look particularly clean, but it was a disguise, and Bruno knew the good explorers always wore the right uh oh, sorry guys. Always wore the right clothes. You still want to help me find Papa, asked Schmel, and Bruno nodded quickly. Of course, he said, although finding Schmel's papa was not as important in his mind as the prospect of exploring the world on the other side of the fence. I wouldn't let you down. Schmel lifted the bottom of the fence off the ground and handed the outfit underneath to Bruno, being particularly careful not to let it touch the muddy ground below. Thanks, said Bruno, scratching his stubbly head and wondering why he hadn't remembered to bring a bag to hold his own clothes in. The ground was so dirty here that they would be spoiled if he left them on the ground. He didn't have a choice, really. He could either leave them here or until later and accept the fact that they would be entirely caked with mud, or he'd call the whole thing off and that, as any explorer of note knows, would have been out of the question. Well, turn around, said Bruno, pointing at his friend as he stood there awkwardly. I don't want you watching me. Schmel turned around and Bruno took off his overcoat and placed it as gently as possible on the ground. Then he took off his shirt and shivered for a moment in the cold air before putting on the pajama top. As it slipped over his head, he made the mistake of breathing through his nose. It did not smell very nice. When was the last, was last washed? He called out and Schmel turned around. I don't know if it's ever been washed, said Schmel. Turn around, shouted Bruno, and Schmel did as he was told. Bruno looked left and right again, but there was still no one to be seen, so he began the difficult task of taking off his trousers while keeping one leg and one boot on the ground at the same time. 
felt very strange taking off his trousers in the open air, and he couldn't imagine what anyone would think if they saw him doing it. But finally, and with a great deal of effort, he managed to complete the task. There, he said, you can turn back now. Schmel turned just as Bruno applied the finishing touch to his costume, placing the striped cloth cap on his head. Schmel blinked and shook his head. It was quite extraordinary. If it wasn't for the fact that Bruno was nowhere near as skinny as the boys on the, his side of the fence, no, not quite so pale either, it would have been difficult to tell them apart. It was almost, Schmel thought, as if they were all exactly the same, really. Do you know what this reminds me of, asked Bruno, said Schmel. And Schmel shook his head. What, he asked. Reminds me of grandmother, he said. Remember I told you about her, the one who died? Schmel nodded. He remembered because Bruno had talked about her a lot over the course of the year and had told him how fond he had been of grandmother and how he wished he'd taken the time to write more letters to her before she passed away. It reminds me of the plays she used to put on with Gretel and me, Bruno said, looking away from Schmel as he remembered those days back in Berlin. Part of the very few memories and how they refused to fade. It reminds me of how she always had the right costume for me to wear. You wear the right outfit and you feel like the person you're pretending to be, she always told me. I suppose that's what I'm doing, isn't it? Pretending to be a person from the other side of the fence. A Jew, you mean, said Schmel. Yes, said Bruno, shifting on his feet a little uncomfortably. That's right. Schmel pointed at Bruno's feet and the heavy boots he had taken from the house. They have to leave them behind too, he said. Bruno looked appalled. But the mud, he said. You can't expect me to go barefoot. You'd be recognized otherwise, said Schmel. You don't have any choice. Bruno sighed, but he knew that his friend was right. And he took off the boots and his socks and left them beside the pile of clothes on the ground. At first, it felt horrible putting his bare feet into such mud, so much mud. They sank down to his ankles, and every time he lifted a foot, it felt worse. But then he started to rather enjoy it. Schmel reached down and lifted the base of the fence, but it only lifted to a certain height. Then Bruno had no choice but to roll under it, getting his striped pajamas completely covered in mud as he did so. He laughed when he looked down at himself. He had never been so filthy in all his life, and it felt wonderful. Schmel smiled too, and the two boys stood awkwardly together for a moment, and accustomed to being on the same side of the fence. Bruno had an urge to give Schmel a hug, just to let him know how much he liked him, and how much he'd enjoyed talking to him over the last year. Schmel had an urge to give Bruno a hug too, just to thank him for all his many kindnesses, and his gifts of food, and the fact that he was going to help him find his papa. Neither of them did hug each other, though, and instead they began to walk away from the fence and towards the camp, a walk that Schmel had done almost every day for a year now, when he had escaped the eyes of the soldiers and managed to get that one part of out with that didn't seem to be guarded all the time, a place where he had been lucky enough to meet a friend like Bruno. It didn't take long to get where they were going. Bruno opened his eyes in wonder at the things he saw. In his imagination, he had thought that all the huts were full of happy families, some of whom sat outside on rocking chairs in the evening and told stories about how things were so much better when they were children. They'd had respect for their elders, not like the children nowadays. He thought that all the boys and girls who lived here would be in different groups playing tennis or football, skipping and drawing out squares for hopscotch on the ground. He had thought that there would be a shop in the center, maybe a small cafe like the ones he'd known in Berlin. He'd wondered whether there would be a fruit and vegetable stall. As it turned out, all the things that he thought might be there weren't. There were no grown-ups sitting on rock chairs on their porches, and the children weren't playing games in groups. And not only was there not a vet fruit and vegetable stall, but there wasn't a cafe either, like there had been back in Berlin. Instead, there were crowds of people sitting together in groups, staring at the ground, looking horribly sad. They all had one thing in common. They were all terribly skinny, and their eyes were sunken, and they all had shaved heads which Bruno thought must have meant they had all been, there had been an outbreak of lice here too. In one corner, Bruno could see three soldiers who seemed to be in charge of a group of about 20 men. They were shouting at them, and some of the men had fallen to their knees and were remaining there with their head, heads in their hands. In another corner, he could see more soldiers standing around and laughing and looking down the barrels of their guns, aiming them in random directions, but not firing them. In fact, everywhere he looked, all he could see was two different types of people either happy, laughing, shouting soldiers in their uniforms, or unhappy, crying people in their striped pajamas, most of whom seemed to be staring into space as if they were actually asleep. I don't think I like it here, said Bruno after a while. Neither do I, said Schmel. I think I ought to go home, said Bruno. 
Schmel stopped walking and stared at him. But Papa, he said, you said you'd help me find him. Bruno thought about it. He had promised his friend that he wasn't the sort to go back on promises, especially when it was the last time they were going to see each other. All right, he said, though he felt a lot less confident now than he had before. But where should we look? You said we need to find evidence, said Schmel, who was feeling upset because he thought that if Bruno didn't help him, then who would? Evidence, yes, said Bruno, nodding his head. You're right, let's start looking. So Bruno kept his word and the two boys spent an hour and a half searching the camp looking for evidence. They weren't sure exactly what they were looking for, but Bruno kept stating that a good explorer would know it when he found it. But they, did find, they didn't find anything at all that might have given them a clue to Schmel's papa's disappearance. And it started to get darker. Bruno looked up at the sky and it looked like it might rain again. I'm sorry, Schmel, he said eventually. I'm sorry we didn't find any evidence. Schmel nodded his head sadly. He wasn't really surprised. He hadn't really expected to. But it had been nice having his friend over to see where he lived all the time, all the same. I think I ought to go home now, said Bruno. Will you walk back to the fence with me? Schmel opened his mouth to answer. But right at that moment, there was a loud whistle and ten soldiers more. More than Bruno had ever seen gathered together in one place before, surrounded an area of the camp, the area in which Bruno and Schmel were standing. What's happening, whispered Bruno. What's going on? It happens sometimes, said Schmel. They make people do go on marches. Marches, said Bruno appalled. I can't go on a march. I have to be home in time for dinner. It's roast beef tonight, Sh said Schmel, putting a finger to his lip. Don't say anything or they get angry. Bruno frowned, but was relieved that all the people in the striped pajamas from this part of the camp were gathering together now, most of them being pushed together by the soldiers, so he and Schmel were hidden in the center of them and couldn't be seen. He didn't know what everyone looked so frightened about. After all, marching wasn't such a terrible thing. And he wanted to whisper to them that everything was all right. The father was the commandant, and that if this was the kind of thing that he wanted the people to do, then it must be all right. The whistles blew again. This time, the group of people, which must have numbered about a hundred, started to move slowly together, with Bruno and Schmel still held together in the center. There was some sort of disturbance towards the back, where some people seemed unwilling to march. But Bruno was too small to see what happened, and all he heard was loud noises like the sound of gunshots but he couldn't make out what they were. Does the marching go on for long, he whispered, because he was beginning to feel quite hungry now. I don't think so, said Schmel. I've never seen the people after they've gone on a march, but I wouldn't imagine it does, Bruno frowned. He looked up at the sky as he did, so there was another loud sound, this time the sound of thunder overhead, and just as quickly the sky seemed to grow even darker, almost black, and rain poured down even more heavily than it had in the morning. Bruno closed his eyes for a moment and felt it wash over him. When he opened them again, he wasn't so much marching as being swept along by the group of people, and all he could feel was the mud that was caked all over his body, and his pajamas clinging to his skin with all the rain, and he longed to be back in his house, watching all this from a distance and not wrapped up in the center of it. That's it, he said to Schmel. I'm going to catch a cold out here. I have to go home. But just as he said this, his feet brought him up, a set of steps and he marched on. He found, and, and as he marched on, he found that there was more, there's no more rain coming down anymore because they were all piling into a long room that was surprisingly warm and must have been very securely built because no rain was getting in anywhere. In fact, it felt completely airtight. Well, that's something, he said. Glad to be out of the storm for a few minutes at least. I expect we'll have to wait here till it eases off and then I'll go, get to go home. Schmel gathered himself very close to Bruno and looked up at him in fright. Sorry we didn't find your papa, said Bruno. It's all right, said Schmel. I'm sorry we didn't really get to play, but when you come to Berlin, that's what we'll do. And I'll introduce you to, oh, what were their names again? He asked himself, frustrated, because they were supposed to be his three best friends for life, but they had all vanished from his memory now. He couldn't remember any of their names, and he couldn't picture any of their faces. Actually, he said, looking down at Schmel, it doesn't matter what it, whether I do or don't. They're not my best friends anymore anyway. He looked down and did something quite out of character for him. He took hold of Schmel's tiny hand in his and squeezed it tightly. You're my best friend, Schmel, he said, my best friend for life. Schmel may, have well, may well have opened his mouth to say something back, but Bruno never heard it because at that moment there was a loud gasp from all the marchers who had filled the room as the door at the front was suddenly closed and a loud metallic sound rang through from the outside. Bruno raised an eyebrow, unable to understand the sense of all this. But he assumed that it had something to do with keeping the rain out. 
and stopping people from catching colds. But then the room went very dark, and somehow, despite the chaos that followed, Bruno found that he was still holding Schmel's hand in his own, and nothing in the world would have persuaded him to let go. Chapter 20, the last chapter. Nothing more was ever heard of Bruno after that. Several days later, the soldiers had searched every part of the house and gone into all the local towns and villages with pictures of the little boy. One of them discovered the pile of clothes and the pair of boots that Bruno had left near the fence. He left them there undisturbed and went to fetch the commandant who examined the area and looked to his left and looked to his right, just as Bruno had done. But for the life of him, he could not understand what had happened to his son. It was as if he had just vanished off the face of the earth and left his clothes behind him. Mother did not return to Berlin quite as quickly as she, was, she had hoped. She stayed out with for several months waiting for news of Bruno until one day, quite suddenly, she thought he might have made his way home alone. So she immediately returned to their old house, half expecting to see him sitting on the doorstep waiting for her. He wasn't there, of course. Gretel returned to Berlin with mother and spent a lot of time alone in her room crying, not because she had thrown her dolls away and not because she had left all her maps behind it out with, but because she missed Bruno so much. Father stayed it out with for another year after that and became very disliked by the other soldiers whom he ordered around mercilessly. He went to sleep every night thinking about Bruno and he woke up every morning thinking about him too. One day he formed a theory about what might have occurred he went back to the place in the fence where the pile of clothes had been found a year before. There was nothing particularly special about this place or different, but then he did a little exploration of his own and discovered that the base of the fence here was not properly attached to the ground as it was everywhere else, and that, when he lifted it, left a gap large enough for a very small person, such as a little boy, to crawl underneath. He looked into the distance then and followed it through logically, step by step, and when he did, he found that his legs seemed to stop working right, as if they couldn't hold up his body any longer. And he ended up sitting on the ground in almost exactly the same position as Bruno had every afternoon for a year, although he didn't cross his legs beneath him. A few months after that, some of the other soldiers came to out with and father was ordered to go with them. And he went without complaint and he was happy to do so because he didn't really mind what they did to him anymore. And that's the end of the story about Bruno and his family. Of course, all of this happened a long time ago, and nothing like that could ever happen again. Not in this day and age. And that is the boy in the striped pajamas. Our story is now complete. I thank you all for tuning in for all these videos and uh, reading the books with me, the, reading the book with me. I know it wasn't the most conventional way of reading, but I'm glad that you guys stuck with it, got through this, and I hope you guys have a great rest of the school year, even though there's only about two days left, and I hope you have, more importantly, a, a wonderful summer. Um, I look forward to seeing you guys all at farewell. Have a great, uh, have a great end of the year, guys. <laughs>